Joel Riedenberg and um, Ron Benartar and the conveners here from Fordham University, so thank them very much for making this possible. And I think today we have a very uh, esteemed and special guest, um, a colleague and a friend, and somebody I hope to love to work with in the future. God willing, as they say. So, Harris Rafiq, uh, you're in for a, a special treat. I, I'm going to excuse myself. I, I've had a crazy schedule. I came in from California, got stuck in Detroit. I'm on my way to, to Connecticut and then Massachusetts. So I'm going to introduce Harris, Harris and then um, depart, unfortunately. But you're in for a treat. Harris Rafiq is a founding director of Century, which is an organization that specializes in countering extremism through consultancy, training, research, and intervention. Harris works to uh, counter and de-radicalize extremists, and he's a leader in combating um, radical uh, religious ideologies, as well as anti-Semitism in the United Kingdom and internationally. He sits on the Northwestern Board of the Mosaic Initiative, led by his Royal Highness Prince Charles, which specializes in mentoring young people to become contributing members to society. Harris is also the co-founder and the first executive director of the Sufi Muslim Council, and is the ambassador for the British is through excuse me is an ambassador for British Islam through the government's project British Islam. He's a board member of the Manchester Interfaith Alliance, and he's involved in interfaith initiatives and has met with uh, faith leaders from literally around the world. Rafiq, Mr. Rafiq has been educated uh, at the University at University College London, which is actually also my alma mater, by the way, and my master's there. And um, he's an exec he did his executive master's of business, business administration at the University of Salford in the United Kingdom. I first met and heard Harris speak at the Global Forum of Anti-Semitism in Jerusalem, and later we were uh, at the inter-parliamentary sessions in Canada and um, heard Harris speak there. I think in a way his work is not only important but it's of great, great urgency. And when you hear him speak and when you speak with him, I would even say, and I, and I mean this uh, sincerely, he res he'll, he'll restore some faith in humanity. There's good people fighting for human rights. There's good people fighting for justice with intelligence and scholarship and creativity. And Harris Rafiq is one of them. So it's really a, a it's an honor that you came here to speak with us. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again soon and continue straight. And welcome to ISGAP's uh, seminar. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Charles. I don't know whether I actually deserve all of the, uh, uh, the plaudits that he's given me, but uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to Iskap uh, and to uh, Joel for uh, inviting me and, and convening this session today. Um, I'm going to try and talk for about 45 to 55 minutes and then try and have a question and answer session afterwards. Uh, and the subject of, um, or the title of my presentation today is Pathways to Islamist Radicalization. To work. Okay. I want to start the session off with really a personal story and how I got involved in this. Uh, my own background is that I'm 47 years of age, I was born and bred in the UK, my parents, uh, my uncles moved to, immigrated to the UK in the 20s, my father went there in 1953, I was born, and I very much lived a very sort of pious life but yet had no dichotomy between being Muslim and British. And about eight years ago, or nine years ago, my youngest daughter, who, who was about eight at the time, uh, came home one day and said, Daddy, I don't want to be a Muslim. And I said, why? And she said, because Muslims are always angry, they're always killing people, and they're always burning guy forces. I thought, well, you know, show me, I want to know where you're getting these messages from. And there she turned on, um, turned on the television, and there were some guys who happened to be Muslim. They looked very angry. They looked like they wanted to kill somebody, and they were burning effigies of George Bush and Tony Blair. And this started a very personal journey for me to actually say, well, hang on a moment. Here is a young girl, a young Muslim girl from a practicing Muslim household, 
but doesn't know anything about politics. She doesn't know anything about Islam, really, other than the very basics, and she sees her father praying uh, five times a day, or her mother praying five times a day. She just knows she doesn't want to be angry. If she's going through this, what messages are other young Muslims getting from, uh, 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 from within society? And just as important for me, what do my non-Muslim neighbors think about Muslims all of a sudden? You know, I, I had no choice when I was younger um, uh, but to mix in society. The school I went to, we were only 5% of the population, so everything was fine. But now we see the urban ghettos and we see Muslims sort of um, uh, living together and not really moving out of their ghettos. So what are non-Muslims thinking about us now as Muslims? So this started a journey for me where I went around the world and I bumped into people like Yusuf Kala, the Vice President of Indonesia. I bumped into the ex-former uh, Crown Prince of Malaysia, who's passed away now, Adi Raja Ashman in Cyprus and up in the US, and finally came full circle and wanted to understand my faith and why are people hijacking it. And really the full circle that I came to was that the faith that my father taught me, which was the spiritual relationship that one has between the individual and God, is really the traditional Muslim views. So I dedicated the rest of my life, my, my corporate world, and dedicated the rest of my life to actually working in this field and understanding what's happening and seeing what I can do about it. And what I'm gonna share with you uh, today is really is, is a brief synopsis of sort of the last six years of, of my work, if you like. The basis of the presentation today really is uh, based on uh, extensive study with former radicals, engagement and research uh, that's been done in the UK and around the world, six years of counter-terrorism work, uh, which I've undertaken working with police, agencies, probation services, community referrals. The channel process is something in the UK where if somebody's identified as displaying extremist tendencies, there is a formal process where that person can be referred um, by agencies or by authorities, and then somebody will go along and deliver some form of intervention. Um, observations of some of the data that's been gathered over the last 10 years uh, and the 120 plus cases that have led to convictions of Islamist terrorists in the UK. Uh, discussions with senior police and also some theoretical studies undertaken by colleagues and researchers looking at uh, the psychological constitution of extremists uh, and the sociopathy. So what I'm going to talk about today, um, very briefly, there will be a paper that will follow this which will go into uh, my research and analysis with a bit more depth, but today is just a, a flavour of synopsis. I think it's important when looking at Islamism to actually define what Islamism is, and then to look at what the differences are between Islamism and traditional Islam. I want to touch on strategic radicalisation that's been taking place over the last 15, 20, maybe 25 years, both in, in, in the West and in the Middle East as well. Look at the pathways. What is it that actually is happening at ground level in terms of young Muslims in the West being radicalized. Looking at some of the institutions, what is the importance of anti-Semitism? Let's make no bones about this. Islamism and the aims and objectives of Islamism are fueled by anti-Semitism. Um, looking at some of the scriptural justification that Islamists use for anti-Semitism, I think it's important because the word kufr and kafir is used a lot. Within, by Muslims to denounce and to de, um, dehumanize non-Muslims. So what really does cl classical traditional Islam, what view does it have on these concepts? Looking at a couple of examples and counter-narratives of some of the things uh, used by uh, groups like Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood, etc., to actually um, promote a form of anti-Semitism and to gather momentum towards their cause. Some classical theology, looking at the traditional role of Christians and Jews in the narrations in the Quran, and then looking at some Jewish relations, some Islamist anti-Semites, and then I want to touch on the mistakes that the US is making in terms of combating violent extremism. I'm going to look at what the policies are here in the US that have been uh, brought into play by President Obama, and those policies and that, that strategy is a direct rip-off of a failed policy that I actually have been involved in in the UK in, uh, since 2005 or 2006 and has now been changed. And then finally some recommendations. So what is Islamism? I guess you know the, the real best way to, to describe it really is that it's a political ideology. 
it is contemporary. Uh, where did it start? Well, you know, I guess there are um, people, we can talk about some of the grandfathers uh, in a later slide, but Islamism in a sense is a combination of faith and politics that assumes a more or less single interpretation of faith as a political creed and system. It has a medical, Islamists have medieval political points of view with modern ideological assumptions and also put into the context of a modern framework, medieval political mindset, but using pre-modern laws. And of course, they all believe in a caliphate, which is a modern ideological state or an empire, which eventually will dominate the world and enforce their version of, of the faith. So who are the grandfathers of uh, Islamism? Well, I guess contemporary Islamism, and I'm not talking about theological movements, um, Islamism as we know it today, is really a phenomenon of modern history. It's paradoxically both Islamism and the extremist brand of Islam and its counterpart, uh, part of the reformist trend, emerged in response initially to the challenge uh, presented by the Western culture, and I say this in the of commerce, uh, and powers of the Arabs and other Muslim peoples. Um, it started, I guess, with the modern change movement. Sometimes uh, that's referred to as the um, 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 modern reform movement, and it was initiated in India by um, a chap called Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan in the Arab world by Jamal, um, uh, Jamal al-Din al-Afghani and Muhammad Abda. Both of these guys considered themselves to be reformers, uh, and they combined traditional Islam with what were in those days modern concepts and instilled in Muslims a pride in their past glory, which is renewed, um, in, hence, in essence renewed their confidence and restored their shattered sense of identity. Um, they stressed the compatibility of Islamic revel uh, revelation with reason and science, um, and that Islam could adapt uh, to the modern world. They distinguished between the unchanging core of Islamic worship and social uh, externals which could change. Um, if we look at some of the, um, the more recent um, post-colonial era, if we look at sort of the 1930s onwards, and we look at the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and we look at the collapse of the British Empire, they left vacuums, and the vacuums were filled by isms. And in Europe, we had fascism and we had communism. In the Middle East, we had Baptism and Islamism. And of course, we know what's happened with Baptism, um, with the collapse of um, uh, Saddam Hussein, and obviously we've got Assad now in Syria, uh, who's actually suffering um, a potential loss in Baptism as well. But Islamism is growing and has grown, uh, and will probably continue to grow with the recent. Uh, uh, Arab winter uh, um, and the I don't call it the Arab Spring, and I'll explain why in a, in a little while. The Arab winter in, in Egypt, Tunisia, and uh, Libya, etc. Uh, and then, of course, we had the Khwan al Muslimin, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hassan al Banna, Qutb, who was a key ideologue um, for modern day Islamists. A lot of his ideas and a lot of the things that he actually, uh, and the way that he actually took Islam and put it into a political framework, are used by Islamists uh, this moment in time. And in India, we had uh, the Jamaat Islami, Madhudi. These two Islamist factions are probably for the UK and the US the single largest ideological impact we will see in terms of how extremism will grow. The reason for that is in the UK, the, probably about 69% of the Muslims there are from an Indian background, Indian subcontinent. And in the US, probably about 50% roughly of Muslims that are in this country come from an Indian or Arab background. So these two, these two um, uh, ideologies are key to what, the, what we're seeing and the way that extremism will grow. And of course we had the merger of the Muslim Brotherhood when they went over to uh, Saudi Arabia, when they were in inverted commas being persecuted by the Egyptians, and they mixed with a theological Wahhabist, selfish form of Islam which gave theological justifications um, to many of the political ideas that they had. And then of course they spread that throughout the world. So what does modern Islamism believe in? Well, there's lots of things that it believes in, but there are three key things. I mentioned before, create the Islamic State with their version of Sharia. In the Muslim Brotherhood at the moment in Egypt, they've done a number of things, but one of the key things they've done in their new draft constitution, Article 2, is that they've actually changed it to that the law of the land in Egypt will be based on Islamic Sharia. 
That means that if that's passed, women, non-Muslims, uh, be, be there in a very few Jew, uh, Jews that are a Jewish diaspora that's in Egypt, but there certainly are plenty of Coptic Christians, people of no faith, will all be judged by the standards of the Sharia or the fiqh that the Muslim Brotherhood have judged to be the word of God and how they believe that um, Muslims or people should behave. And thirdly, wipe Israel off the map. That is key to everything. If any Islamist tells you that um, uh, they don't believe in these things, they're lying. I can quite categorically assure you from their literature, from their own, if you look at Hamas's uh, uh, constitution, if you look at the Muslim Brotherhood's constitution, Jamaat Islami's constitution, these three things are key, amongst other things, to what they believe in. And of course, the political ideology and theology is designed and it needs an enemy to fight. It cannot exist without an enemy. So let's look at the differences between traditional Islam and Islamism. Just as we have social and socialism, one is the concept of how we define we live together. Now, social and socialism is the stage in Marxist, Leninist theory, uh, which is intermediate between capitalism and communism. Islam and Islamism are different as well. Islam is a monotheistic uh, religion which is char uh, categorically uh, characterized by the acceptance and the, uh, of the doctrine of submission to one God and to Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the chief and last prophet of God. And I mentioned that uh, Islam, Islamism is a political ideology. I that Islam is not only a religion but a political system. These are the two key main differences that many people forget. And I, and I, and I talk, I mean, I'm a practicing Muslim and I know many other practicing Muslims in the UK and around the world as well. It's very easy when somebody stands up and criticizes Islamism to be branded Islamophobic. Well, first of all, I don't like the term Islamophobia because I don't think it applies because Muslims aren't of one race, we don't have one culture, we're not one people. If somebody in Indonesia will practice Islam, totally different to somebody in Saudi Arabia, to somebody in Britain, etc. But let's say it's, you know, this term is being used and it's been hijacked by, uh, by Islamists. It's not wrong, it's actually I would believe every. I, I, I would. I would say every human being. Um, um, it's it's up to every human being to actually try. Who cares about human rights? Who cares about um, how we interact as a society? To actually start talking about Islamism and the difference between Islam and criticize Islamism for what it really is. Uh, and again, you know, Islam is is a state primarily a way uh, to God. It is full of sp spiritual traditions. I mentioned that there is a diverse interpretation of Sharia. And as a university which is uh, probably the oldest um, uh, in inverted commas Muslim university in the world, has counted four or recognizes 440 legitimate versions of jurisprudence or fiqh in Arabic. So one person will practice Sharia or fiqh differently. So I'll give you an example, it's an anecdotal example. I remember uh, about two or three years ago, I was uh, when I was involved more closely in, in the Sufi Muslim Council. There was a, a woman who, who who came and approached me, and she said, "I'm a Muslim woman who hadn't had a civil registration ceremony, but had been married according to Sharia law in the of Commerce, and she wanted to get a divorce." And you know, after a bit of conversation with her, I realised actually, you know, the marriage probably wouldn't work, and they tried. So I took her to. Uh, I asked her which version of fiqh do you follow. And she said Hanafi. Fine. So I took her to a scholar, uh, who a mufti who was a Hanafi scholar, who went through a process uh, of helping her to get a divorce. After three, a three-month period in the process, she had a piece of paper with stamp, the stamp on it that said that she was now divorced and no longer married to this guy. Well, of course, the guy, her husband or ex-husband, as far as she was concerned, practiced a different form of Sharia, a different form of fiqh, and didn't recognise this divorce at all. So here we had a situation that half her family thought she was divorced and the other half didn't recognize it. And it's a nonsense. So when talking about Sharia, let's be very careful uh, when considering what version of fiqh somebody is following, because it doesn't all mean the same to everybody. Uh, and of course, you know, Islamism um, assumes a single type of enforcement of Sharia. Let's look at uh, Muslims in the West. I don't get this working. So what's happening? 
Well, according to the Pew Research Center, there are probably about 45 Muslims, million Muslims living in, in the West, as we know it. And this is uh, from a study of uh, some research carried out in 2009. Various heritage, mainly Asian, Turkish, but less Arabs than you would think. We often associate Islam uh, and Muslims with being Arab, but they are a very, very small percentage of the Muslims that are living, not only in the West, but worldwide. Uh, most Muslims have, living in the West have a very, very poor Islamic education. I remember when I was younger, and I wanted to, my, my parents shipped me off to mosque, and we learned two, I learned two things in the mosque. One, how to um, incorrectly pronounce the Quran, and secondly, how to carry out my daily functions and my daily roles and responsibility. That's it. As I got older, if I wanted to research more about my faith, it was very easy, not knowing Arabic at the time, for extremists to come along and talk to me, throw in a few Arabic uh, phrases, and I said, well, actually, you know what you're talking about, I don't know what I'm talking about, and you must be right. So they turned around in, in those days, if I, if I was 18 or 19, uh, and somebody had come along to me and said, I, I'm quoting Bukhari, Hadith, this, and the Prophet Muhammad is going this, or this, that, and the other, and you must kill apostates. I had no resilience, because I never had the Islamic education as I was growing up. And this is a typical case for the majority of Muslims who are living in the West as they're growing up. Uh, there is a generational growth of Islam. Muslims are younger. 70% of the Muslims in the UK are under the age of 40. This is from Salford University, uh, a piece of research that I commissioned uh, in 2009. We have the misdirection by Islamic scholars. There's a lot of tensions between communities and fear and distrust. I feel sorry for the people in the US. In the UK, after about five or six years of hard work, we're starting to have a more nuanced debate about Islamism and about Islam and Muslims. What I'm hearing, and you guys may tell me I'm, I'm wrong, is that what I'm hearing from the press and sort of some of the coverage I get from the US, the debate here is Islam good, Islam bad. Muslims good, Muslims bad. There's no nuance in the middle. And this creates fear and distrust amongst communities. And of course, there's a lack of understanding of um, uh, Muslims, be they British or be they uh, American or Western, amongst non-Muslims, which is fueling this. But there's also a lack of understanding amongst Muslim, Muslims about the Western culture, be it UK, US. And I'll give you another anecdotal um, um, piece of, I'll share with you another anecdote. When, when I was about, when I was about, about five or six years ago, there was a, a young chap, who was about 23, 24, and Kevin approached me, he was a friend of my, my nephew's, and he'd grown up in a ghetto, if you like, only had Muslim friends, went to a school where 99% of the kids were Muslim, went to university, and only met and, and, and mixed with Muslims, started with his father's family business, and the majority of all of his customers were Muslim, and then he fell out with his father and he wanted a job. So I helped him get a job, and I recommended him to one of my former employers, and he got a job with a, a nice salary, company car, mobile phone, laptop, health benefits, the whole works. He came and saw me about two or three months later and said, he called me uncle, which made me feel old, but he came up and, and said, uncle, I've got to leave. I want to leave my job. I said, why have you made it with your father? Is that why? He said, no, I can't work there anymore. I said, why? He said, because I can't really get on with people when all they want to talk about is getting drunk, eating pork, uh, one person happened to be uh, homosexual. He just couldn't, he couldn't fit and function in an environment where he wasn't used to functioning. And eventually he left. This is happening in the UK, it's happening across Europe, and it's now happening in the US as well. Why? Because there is a perception which has been fueled by the Islamists that the war, there is a war against Islam and a war against Muslims, and the best way to combat it is to keep in strength in numbers. So we have this, and of course we have a growth in anti-Semitism, uh, which is one of the key, you know, item number three in sort of the the, the, the things that um, um, the Muslim Brotherhood and the, uh, the Islamists want to do is to wipe Israel off the map. So anti-Semitism is important for them. And it really existed in Europe um, long before the Muslim world. And some commentators believe, um, and Bernard Lewis is, is one of these, that it's been absorbed into, that the European anti-Semitism has been absorbed uh, into some of the Muslim traditions for political use. 
And of course, you know, um, some Muslim organizations will and are purveying a particularly dangerous concept. And that concept in Arabic is al-wala al barah al And that means loyalty and enmity for the sake of God. That essentially is teaching to young Muslims now that if somebody is different to you, has different beliefs to you, they could be other Muslims, they could be people who are Jewish, they could be Christian, whatever. For the sake of God, you have to do one of three things. You have to either fight them, if you can't fight them, you have to debate them or criticize them. If you can't criticize them or debate them, you have to do the lowest form, which is hate them in your heart. Now, I believe that's the most dangerous one. But they consider that to be the lowest, lowest form. This has been taught in the US, uh, it's been taught in the UK, it's been taught in the Middle East and around the world. So let's look at strategic radicalization. This is done through observations and research uh, over the last um, 10 years. The problem with um, radicalizing a, a, a Muslims in, in, in the West uh, and around the world is that you have to teach them to reject and take on board an extreme ideology which their parents didn't believe in and their grandparents. You know, my father certainly didn't believe in anti-Semitism. He never taught me anti-Semitism. You know, in fact, he taught me to stand up for human rights, irrespective of, of who or what that person believes in, whether it's a faith, somebody of faith or no faith at all, it doesn't matter. And he actually taught me that that's what God wants me to do. And this is what used to be taught. So for somebody to be radicalized, they have to believe, go against what their parents believed. And the only way to actually uh, accomplish that uh, is to change the Muslim mindset. And that's what these guys want to do. And they want to do this in, in, in Europe, in the US, and the Arab lands as well. And the taxes that they use in the UK and around the world um, is to create a series of, um, uh, of organizations and institutions which are controlled by uh, complicated interlock directories. And I've done some work in the UK around this about mapping who the organizations are, the Muslim organizations in the UK. And guess what? The mainstream majority Moderates have been sleeping for the last 15 years. But we've woken up. And I, I remember when I first, in 2005, when I was on the task force, I was invited onto the task force to look at what the government response should be uh, to 7 7. And I remember Tony Blair gave this fantastic speech that I believed in. And the reason why I accepted the position was he said that the root cause for 7 7 was Wahhabist ideology, um, which is fueling. Islamist political agendas. Because he made that speech, that's the only reason I agreed to go on the task force. When I went onto the task force, I soon realized that the Muslims that were there, 95% of the Muslims that were there, British Muslims, were from that same ideology that the Prime Minister had just said was a problem. So we were sleeping. And I remember going to meetings in those days, government meetings, and out of about nine people in a room, I'd be the only person that I would ever want my children to be talking to. None of the other eight people. I wouldn't let them anywhere near my children, never mind anybody else, you know. Never mind talking to a Secretary of State or a Minister and giving advice on that. But luckily through the work that I and others have done, now in the UK, government meetings, if there are nine people there, only one of them will be Islamist. So things have changed in the UK, but unfortunately not in the US, and I'll, I'll share with you why. So these organizations really, they focus on media, on the institutions, and Muslim institutions like mosques, um, sport, uh, sports facilities, and a whole range of things. And they, on TV even, and they focus on teaching Muslims four things. That the practices that their parents believed in, that they brought as immigrants, fit into either being bida, shirk, haram, which leads them to kuffar. What do these words mean? Bida is innovation. Shirk means false association with the deity. Haram means not allowed in their version. And kufr means a state of disbelief. I'll give you another anecdote. In around about two, 2007, I was delivering a speech uh, at a Muslim, uh, Muslim centre uh, um, in, in the northwest of England. And after the speech, uh, there was a couple hundred people there, and after the speech, one guy came and asked me if he could have, uh, you know, have a good time with me. And we went into a room and uh, he started crying. And the, the Pakistani in me wanted to hug him, and the Britishness in me sort of wanted to push him away. So I sort of ended up doing something like this. But then he got to his story. 
And his story was that he was an immigrant who came, went over to the UK at a very young age, and he worked hard. He worked in the foundries, he worked as a laborer, manual laborer, and he wanted his children to move up the social ladder, and he had worked very hard to provide his son an education, and his son was reading medicine. You know, he got into medical school in Manchester. Fantastic. But then what happened was, about a year down the line, he noticed his son was praying, practicing, fulfilling his Islamic uh, obligations. He was growing a beard, he was um, you know, wearing his trousers above his ankles, which is a Islamic brand of Islam. But never mind, never mind. You know, Not only is he going to be a doctor, but he's also going to be a much more pious Muslim than him. Second year, his son started uh, talking about um, uh, politics, about Iraq, about Afghanistan, and asking all sorts of questions which his father couldn't answer, but still never mind. And then the back end of the second year, he noticed something very strange. His son would sit at home, and he, on his plate, he would separate his food in half. He would eat one half, and he would leave the other half. That's very strange. So he asked his mother, he uh, got his wife to ask him why. And eventually the son told him that because his father was wishing his next door neighbor, who happened to be Christian, a Merry Christmas, he was committing shirk, associating a false deity. He was doing something which was bitter and innovation, which meant that he was entering a state of kufr, disbelief, which meant that the food that his father was providing for him was haram, I guess the opposite of kosher. But because he was fighting this jihad, this struggle, it was more important for him to live. And there's a concept in Sharia of fiqh that uh, you always take the lesser evil. For example, Muslims are not allowed to eat pork. But if that's all there is to eat, a Muslim must eat pork because, it, because to not eat pork, you're committing suicide, and that's the greatest sin. But only eat enough to stay alive. But because the jihad to him was that more, more important, he was eating half of the food in order to have some strength and carry on with what he was doing. Then the real stinger. About two or three months after he noticed that, he found a letter addressed to him and his wife that his son and decided he was going to go off to Afghanistan to fight jihad. And this was why he was crying. And the last time I spoke with this chap was around about 2010, and he still didn't know where his son was. And this is the first internal stages of radicalizing Muslims. The second aspect is, uh, sorry, the first of the second aspect is to target and create Muslim organizations that claim to represent Islam both in the UK, the USA, and around the world. And I'll put a diagram that will show that. And the third uh, aspect is creating um, a group of charities or NGOs and shell companies uh, which are set up to manage the movement of finances and raise money to support terrorist activities or extremist activities, both in the West and abroad. And again, this whole process is designed to um, create a rapid ideological change, one that actually affects changes in the community as a whole. Nothing new is how communism was spread, fascism was spread, uh, and all they've done is taken some of the old ideas, mixed them with theology, and said it's all for God. So what does this complicated diagram mean? This is the second phase, the setting up of organizations. Let's take the bottom of as the ideology, the takfiri, the, uh, um, the casting out of, of, of Muslims who don't portray or practice their own particular form of Islam. Because uh, let's not forget, the first target, as I just mentioned, for these extremists is other Muslims. Uh, and again, through health clubs, mosques, universities, etc. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got a set of organizations, and on the left, we've got a, a set of organizations in black. And these, these organizations will sort of operate around the world through uh, memorandums of understanding, MOUs, and there are organizations in the US which have signed up to organizations in the UK, uh, which the British government won't have any dealings with, and yet the uh, American ambassador will invite to uh, Eid receptions, which is quite funny and quite bizarre. Um, but let's say, um, for example, that these are designed to capture and bring in Muslims. Let's say, for example, that there is a young Muslim who's quite violent, a bit of a thug, a bit of a criminal, Organizations or groups such as Al Muhajirun will be set up on the right hand side, which will often portray a form of physical activism. Let's go on the left. Let's say that 
you know, the majority of Pakistani Muslims tend to have this desire to play cricket or sport or, or whatever, a number of youth clubs will be set up by these organizations which will bring these youngsters in and give them their form of Islam. Mohammed Sadiq Khan, the leader of the 7-7 Bombers, taught and brought in other Muslims in youth clubs. Let's move up the chain on the right hand side. A lot of Muslims go to university, and I remember when I was in university, I was a member of CND because I thought it was very. I thought that in the 80s, that you know, I was worried about somebody dropping a bomb on me and that we'd die, etc. So I thought it was important to actually physically try and do something to ban the bomb. Fine, university activism. A lot of people go for that. Groups. There are groups and organisations that pull people in to actually do something. In the UK, we have uh, groups like Impact UK that'll do that. And I'm, I won't mention any American groups yet, but, but maybe I will a bit later on if people want to ask questions. Now, on the left-hand side, again, you get the idea. Most Muslims want to go there and just have a good time. But we, we have this weird concept as British and um, American Muslims. We might drink alcohol. We might do all sorts of things that we don't want to do. But come Friday or come Ramadan, all of a sudden we discover our faith. You know, so people during Ramadan will passively start involved organizing activities like break a fast and bring people and I presented at one of these um, uh, functions in 2007 and I couldn't leave quickly enough when I actually found that Hamas and Hezbollah were also there as well. Uh, I just wanted to get out of there and uh, thought it wasn't very good. And not only because of what they're portraying but I was also concerned about you know, if any of the agencies might have seen me and thinking I'm, you know, am I linked to these groups there? And it was very early on in my career. And as you can see this goes up on the right and up the left as well. But just as importantly for these, that black line on the, on the, on the right-hand side represents a blockage blocking out the majority mainstream moderate Muslims. And this is done in a number of ways. One of the key ways that they do it in the US and the UK is by infiltrating the bureaucracy. Because Islamists, Islamism, as I mentioned, is a political ideology and they crave the oxygen that they need is political uh, legitimacy and credibility. Let's move on to the pathways. I, I, I've sort of been, because there's been some really good work carried out in, the, in, in New York actually by the New York Police Department and also by uh, um, an acquaintance of mine, who, uh, Madeline Bruin, who sort of looked at some of the, the ways that radicalization have been taking place. And I often used to think of it as, a few years ago, as a single trajectory. That's not actually the case anymore. It is dynamic. Things are moving on. Um, and I want to talk about, very, just touch on uh, four pathways that I believe, through the counterterrorism work that we're doing on the ground, with about 15 members of staff de radicalizing um, um, extremists in the UK, what I believe is actually happening on the ground. Am I going the right way? Yeah. The first pathway really is a belief in a worldview that the West is at war with Islam. The selective observation of political issues uh, as grievances actually leads to accepting the plausibility uh, of violent ideologies as normal and appropriate to the world. This then sees that the extremist ideology is the only ideology in a reading of religious texts that are co uh, consonant and resonant with the world as it is. These individuals are often not drawn into um, the theology of Wahhabi Jihadism, which you know, uh, there's been a lot of talk about. But to the political projects and activities as being a manifestation of fighting a war um, against Islam that is being fought by and perpetrated by, in their view, the West. Whether it's the cartoons, irrelevant films like this 12 minute dubbed film that people are sort of, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen it, I've seen it. It's a film that somebody's dubbed, for God's sake, you know, and, 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 and Muslims are doing the marketing for it. 30, last time I looked at it, there were 13 million hits on Google. Well, if crazy Muslims hadn't gone and done what they were doing, nobody would have known anything about it. Um, so whether it's that, or the wars in the geopolitical East, uh, one of the many other myriad of examples cited, they're viewed as examples of this war against Islam. Acts of terror are then seen in the same light as a response to this war, either intellectually, politically, and from a military perspective as well. We found that the best way to engage, or I found the best way to engage um, with these people is not to immediately challenge the theology, because it doesn't matter. The theology isn't really important to these guys. 
but to get, to see, get them to see the world in a more nuanced manner. Looking at the media, looking at the parliamentary debate, policy, government decisions, etc., and not all for and against Islam. Creating, if we can do this and create some sort of critical thought, uh, or critical thinking from their perspective, it creates a framework uh, where the world, as they view it, is comprehensively changed. And this then in turn um, facilitates a more nuanced approach to the religious texts, which need to be tackled at some stage, uh, and it becomes, it becomes uh, to make more sense that such an approach uh, should exist for these people. In essence, we need to tackle, for these people, a mixture of grievances viewed through a specific narrative and an ideological view of Islam and terrorism. Let's look at number two. There are only four that I'm going to cover. Uh, in this section. Theological terrorism. There are individuals who believe and have a full, fully blown belief that the Islamist ideology is the only valid political reality that Muslims can accept. This is, this, this is growing at an exponential rate. You know, I, I, I remember doing a presentation in Jerusalem in two, 2009 at the Global Forum on Combating Antisemitism and I asked the question, and I asked the question of myself and the audience as well. And the question was, is anti-Semitism becoming the default position amongst Muslims in the West sub the age of 40? There is lots of evidence to suggest that that is the case, and that's because these guys believe it is their religious duty to believe in Islamist ideology, and it's the only way that you can be a practicing Muslim. They believe that terrorism is a form of jihad, or struggle, and it's there to remove uh, governments and the supporters, i.e. Uh, either in the West, uh, if they're supporting these governments, are actually from what they refer to as an in inverted commas, Muslim lands. The best way to engage with these people, after dealing with the specific issue of violence, um, and looking at the underpinning mindset, we can only engage with them by demonstrating the pluralism of Islam and the way that Islam exists, as I mentioned earlier on, in different countries and is practiced differently around the world. The third one. This is a phenomenon of more recent terms, I guess, post 9-11, I guess. There are individuals in the UK, the USA, who may be of an Iraqi, Pakistani, or Afghani origin, who've had some personal loss. You know, they may have relatives or friends or somebody that they know uh, from any of these countries who have been hurt or even killed by collateral damage by drones or by, you know, by whatever way. Engaging with these kind of people can be difficult. It requires the management of emotions, but more importantly, allowing those emotions to be expressed um, and allowing them to actually express some sort of moral reaction and building on it. For example, Civilians being hurt or being killed, collateral damage or whatever, does not equate to them killing other civilians. So this is probably one of the most difficult forms or pathways to actually uh, uh, to take on. Um, but we have to do this by enforcing the theological justifications of them taking a different point of view if they want to stay within the form uh, or, or the parameters of mainstream traditional Islam. And finally, the, the last one that I want to touch on is there are people with mental health problems. We have, we've had guys in the UK and certainly in the US as well who've been targeted by jihadis. And these guys are vulnerable. Mainstream agencies and authorities need to work together with people who can provide interventions and really focus on these people. Um, and looking at people's mental state um, as well as specialised interventions uh, as well, and at least play a role, and we've had some success in this as well. I'm going to just um, fly, through. I'm not going to touch on this slide because I've talked about some of the tactics already. I want to talk a little bit about the institutions. I'm going to make a statement that mosques themselves, in my opinion, are not the main, main uh, source of radical activities when it comes to violent ideologies, nor are they the most likely place in which to find extremist ideologues engaging in activism. But I want to just elaborate on that statement. 
because it is true that there are exceptions. And the exceptions are some mosques will allow extremist organizations to hold classes there. And I talked about the triangle. They will allow groups like Hizb Tahrir, who exist in many of the, in London, I've counted, just in central London, Hizb Tahrir exists in 24 different guises. In my hometown, in Rochdale, where there are only 15,000 Muslims, I've counted at least 12 front organizations. These organizations will practice and will actually hold things like Arabic classes in mosques. Some mosques, unfortunately, are led by people who support extremist ideology, may not necessarily support violence, but in essence support some of the theological justifications. There are activists who are part of the mosques who will operate, recruiters who will operate in mosques. And of course, some institutions are theologically, some mosques are theologically uh, sympathetic to certain brands of terrorism and extremism. For example, some mosques will pray for the destruction of, Israel's, uh, of Israel. Some mosques will pray for destructions of Gaffer. And when they say Gaffer, they talk about, and I'll talk about what is Gaffer in my view, traditional classical Islam, they're talking about people who are Jewish, Christian, etc. So that, unfortunately, is a reality. The internet, uh, experts are sort of divided on this. Um, and, you know, I want to share with you some of my findings uh, with around the internet. The internet is a place where individuals who already have a cause or motivation to actually explore extremist viewpoints will actually find information. It's readily available. Uh, there are individuals who see it as a, as a, as a medium by which they can um, spread um, anonymously their ideology and theology, either by the way of propaganda, uh, and also looking at and working in forums to create arguments and dis uh, debates and discussion that are initially theoretical or, or theological uh, uh, from a fake jurisprudence perspective, but in these discussions they're always looking to recruit. Some people, as uh, Maslow discovered in his hierarchy, uh, uh, hierarchy of needs, there are some people who want to find a community on the internet. And there are people, you know, uh, I think there was, a, there was a, a report that I read a few years ago that the internet has, certainly in the UK and I'm guessing the US as well, overtaken the TV as the most as the most used medium. So yes, you know, there are people who want to belong to a community. It's very easy now being somebody. I mean, I went out to Indonesia as part of an official government uh, trip, and I, I had a realization a few years ago that it's very easy for somebody to be to have their education paid for by the Muslim Brotherhood in Indonesia, because people are poor. They'll give them room, um, they'll give them some food to eat, pay for the university course. All they have to do is record certain ideas on a camera, on a laptop, and just get them all anywhere around the world. This is one of the downsides of globalization. Uh, and of course, it's also a means of discrete communication. One of the things that we analyzed is that porn sites are often used by extremists to disseminate their ideas and even messages to each other. Uh, and if you think about porn being diametrically opposed to a practicing Muslim, <coughs> hey, it's justified because their jihad uh, is more important than, uh, than anything else. This is, I thought, was possibly going to be a contentious one, but there aren't, I guess, that many students here. Higher and further education. Um, well, 47% of the convicted terrorists in the UK attended universities. And six convicted terrorists were former presidents of the Islamic societies, including the underpants former. He was a president of the Islamic society at my old university and Charles's, uh, as you mentioned, university, university college in London. Um, but, you know, there are, it's happening in universities. It's, you know, I talked about activism and universities being a place where people want to have ideas and discussions. But the problems are that there are apparent mainstream institutions in universities which are endorsing extremist preachers. They're inviting them to come and give speeches. They may not give a speech on the venue on a university site where they're saying, go and kill somebody who's Jewish. Go and bomb somebody who is Israeli, even if they're off duty or they're not in the army or whatever. Or you know, uh, They may not say it at university. But what it is actually doing is actually they're on the university, they're actually bringing these people to their viewpoints and then on their websites or in other areas or in private discussions, they're actually saying things like that. They're actually saying throw homosexuals off the mountain. They're actually saying apostates should be killed. 
there are many violent terrorist supporters um, and activists who have been operating on campus, and the political discourses prevent an objective analysis taking place. There isn't really a great deal of resource invested in looking at what's happening in universities, and some of it really is down to sensitivities. You know, there is this debate about should students be allowed to explore ideas and political ideologies at university and not, and what are the parameters? I guess the parameters are, are you, are you gonna, is it possible that you're gonna end up killing somebody? Is it possible you're gonna end up blowing yourself up? Is there enough opposite <coughs> and counter discussion and debate? And I can tell you, certainly in the UK, there isn't, there hasn't been enough. I think I, I would hazard a guess Maybe that may be the case here in the US as well. And we need to, I think, devote more resources in looking at this and actually taking on some of these guys at universities. Prisons, you know, I guess there are, you know, for, for want of a better word, you know, again, another main area of radicalization. One of the things we do in prisons is we take somebody who's a convicted terrorist, convicted jihadist, we put him in with other Muslims. Hey, great. Why not let him radicalize others? You know, so people are coming out of prison radically. I remember, again, another anecdote, uh, being called down at two o'clock in the morning by the police in, in Greater Manchester, who wanted me to come and talk down this, this guy, who had turned up at a mosque. And he wanted to go into this modern mosque and go and kill the imam. I pulled him over and started having a chat with him. He said, what's going on? He was somebody who had gone to prison, he wasn't a Muslim, he was, he was black, and he associated because of racial prejudice by other people who were of colour, be they brown, whatever, and these guys happened to be Muslims, he converted to Islam, and he believed that when he, when he left Belmarsh prison, it was his duty to go out and kill moderate Salat Imams. And I had, to, I had to sort of try and talk him down, and we got involved with him, we mentored him, and now he's one of the leading activists in de radicalising um, um, jihadists. Um, let's talk about the importance of anti Semitism. Mona El Tahawi, who you may, some of you may have heard of, you know, said that uh, Israel is the opium of the Arabs. Yeah, we talked about Islamists. It is an intoxicating way for them to forget their own failings or at least blame them on someone else. The discourse of the Arab League is always anti-Israel. It's always a scapegoat. And anti-Semitism is all, uh, the hatred of people who are Jewish or Israeli is always there at the back of the minds of many of the people in the Middle East. Why? Let's look at some of the scriptural justifications. <sighs> this is an interesting one. There are a number of statements, verses in the Quran and Hadith, which apparently justify the taking uh, hostile attitudes towards people of the book, especially the Jews. And I talked about al wala al uh, uh, earlier on. Islamists, uh, actually take these as being general, take them as being applicable today, and take them to describe people not based on actuality, but essentially as their nature. Traditional classical Islam, the traditional scholars from the Ottoman era and many others as, before that as well, didn't take them in this format. They took them as not being general. They didn't take them to be applicable even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him, and certainly not um, used to describe uh, a, a, a form of people, but actually individuals or certain contextualized activities or events that actually took place. Uh, and there's an example there as well. Traditional scholars do not take them as Islamists do now. What is Kufr and Kafir? There's a, a busy slide there. Uh, and by the way, this, all of this will be available in the paper later. I'm just touching on it. Basically, Islamists will have you believe that anybody who's a non-Muslim is a gaffer. Traditional scholars, Islamic scholars, like Sheikh uh, Shaltoot, the late uh, respected Mufti from al Azhar University that I mentioned, believes that kufr before God is only somebody who denies after knowing through uh, obstinacy, uh, through uh, haughtiness, or through um, general denial, and knows for a fact, in it, and has been given a message, be it 
Judea, through being Jewish, through being uh, Muslim or Christianity or whatever. And only then, by knowing the truth, decides to hide the truth, is somebody a kafir. So when the Quran in traditional classical Islam talks about kafir, it doesn't talk about people who are non-Muslim in the form that we, know, that we talk about it now. And again, you know, um, shirk, as I mentioned before, um, in the Quran, in uh, Surah uh, Al-Naml, verse number 14, as it's mentioned in the Quran, God doesn't forgive shirk, but it doesn't, the polytheism that arises from, as I mentioned, from holiness and uh, obstinacy regarding what God says, that they rejected him through, um, though they were certain of an oppression and haughtiness. And anybody who rejects Islam doesn't mean that they're kafir, it just means that the Muslim obligations are applicable to them. And the Quran says very clearly that anybody and everybody, from a Muslim perspective, traditional classical view, will get the rewards of anything that they do, any good that they do. Let's look at uh, killing of the Jews towards the end time. Hamas's favorite um, statement that there will come a time in the end times when the rocks will cry, oh Abdullah, there is a Jew hiding behind me, or a trees will say there's a Jew hiding behind me, kill him. Well, this, particular, this hadith does exist. This hadith is taken out of context, it's taken as khabar ahad. It's taken as an isolated narration of a particular hadith. These hadiths are designed to be taken in certain um, group collectives. This hadith is talking about the end times. But there are other hadiths that actually explain this even more. And, and, and uh, Memonite, or Memonite, I think the correct pronunciation, uh, also talks about these collectives of hadiths from his perspective. And this talks about the Messiah. And what will happen when the Messiah comes during the end times? And the other hadiths actually say, well, you know what? The first battle will be, uh, when the Messiah turns up, there will be Muslims, there will be people who are Jewish, there will be people who are Christian, people of no faith, who will accept the Messiah, and then there are also people who won't. And the first battle, which Hamas don't tell you about, they say, ah, it's a weak, weak hadith. But it's there in Bukhari, it's either in there or it isn't, just as this one is or it isn't, is that seven, the first battle will be with Muslims, and 70,000 Muslim ulama, scholars, will be killed. They don't tell you this. And when, it's to, when they're referring to Abdullah, it's a general term, servant of God. Somebody who is Jewish, somebody who is Christian, somebody who is Muslim, or no faith who accepts the Messiah in traditional classical Islam, becomes a servant of God. So that's what it refers to and has been the traditional um, um, view until the Islamists, even the Wahhabis and Salafists, sort of decided that uh, they hijacked. Let's look at something interesting. I talked about wiping Israel off the map. Well, the Quran actually justifies the state of Israel. The Quran actually says, Pharaoh sought to scare them, the Israelites, out of the land of Israel. But we, Allah or God, drowned him, talking about Pharaoh, together with all who were with him. And we, Allah, said to the Israelites, dwell in this land, the land of Israel. When the promise of the hereafter, end of days, comes to be fulfilled, we, Allah, shall assemble you, the Israelites, all together in the land of Israel. And also went on to say, um, uh, talked about the good news and uh, um, the night journey as well. This is uh, chapter number 17, ayahs or verses number 100 to 104. In this, God wants, in these two, two, two verses, God wanted to give Abraham a double blessing through Ishmael and through Isaac. This is what Muslims believe, and the Quran tells us, in order that Ishmael's descendants should live in the desert of Arabia and Isaac's in Canaan. The Quran specifically recognizes the land of Israel as the heritage of the Jews, and it explains that before the last judgment, Jews will return to dwell, dwell there. I believe traditional classical Islamic scholars believe that this prophecy has already been fulfilled. Theologically, theoretically, however, ideologically, however you want to look at this, Muslims must believe in the Quran. This verse and the mounds of research and, and, and the books that have been written on it, uh, there's some very interesting ones uh, from Sheikh Palazzi, from Italy, and a number of others who have talked about this, proves the legitimacy of the land of Israel. And again, you know, looking at um, the, the, the classic theology, again, I, I'll, I'll just sort of click, um, click through this. I want to look at the role of Jewish and Christian narrations in um, uh, Quranic um, uh, exegesis. Uh, the, 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 as we say in Arabic, 
the heir Israelina. The Prophet himself told the Muslims not to reject the teaching of the Jews regarding the lives of the other Prophets and their sayings. He also said in an authentic hadith, Haddatu anhum wa la haraj. Narrate from them, there is no harm. There was, however, a condition. And the criteria was, um, do not deny what has been said, except if it conflicts with the Quranic account of hadith. There is that criteria in there. But we have the tradition, uh, or traditions of the Jewish people in interpreting the Qur'an. Wahhabis nowadays have started to expunge uh, these from their edition of books. For example, uh, Tafsir Ibn Kathir is now tampered with, uh, and in inverted commas, authenticated, and edited by the Saudis, and uh, it's disseminated around the world. Right now you can go and buy, or you can get one of these Qur'ans, free of charge, from your local Saudi institution. Of course, we know, I, um, I guess some of the audience know about some of the, the uh, anti uh, or the Islamist anti Semites. We have uh, Haji Amin al Husseini, who supported Hitler and, and worked with the Nazi, Hassan al Banna, modern day Yusuf al Karadawi, who, who now has become one of the most important or influential scholars, in inverted commas, in the Middle East and around the world. He is one of the spiritual gurus of the Ikhwan al-Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and in Tunisia and other countries as well. What does he say? Well, I'll just quote some of the things that he says. Uh, he says words, things like, O oh Allah, take this oppressive Jewish Zionist band of people. O oh Allah, do not spare a single one of them. O oh Allah, count their number and kill them, down to their very last one. Uh, Paul Berman did a, um, a piece on this, and I've, I sort of um, got this translation from him. Um, and he's also said, throughout history, Allah has imposed upon them, the Jews, people who would punish them for their corruption. The last punishment was carried out by Hitler by means of all things he did to them. Even though they exaggerated this issue, he managed to put them in their place. After the Arab winter, not the Arab spring, he led the largest congregation of Salat al Juma, the Friday prayers. He was given this honor. Over a million people in Tahrir Square Pray the, the, the Friday congregational prayers behind this chair. Very important figure, um, as there are many others as well. And of course, we have Shia inspired uh, uh, Islamism as well, which is from the likes of Muhammad, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Let's talk about what the US is doing. I'll speed through these a little bit because I'm a bit conscious of time. How, how are we doing for time? Are we okay to go a little bit over? Okay. Let's look at uh, what the government is doing in the, U in the US. The government has actually come out with something called Combating Violent Extremism, launched about, uh, launched in August 2011. What it was designed to do, let's take this diagram. Let's say that there are, in various from country to country, X percent of people, Muslims, who actually support violence. There's Y percent who sympathize with violence, and uh, Z percent, uh, or Z as you say, who empathize. How quickly has it been observed that it's taken somebody who empathizes to go to somebody who supports violence? The shortest period has, that's been observed by Canadian intelligence agencies, by Dutch intelligence agencies, and work that I've done with UK intelligence and, uh, uh, agencies, one and a half weeks is the shortest time I've seen this. From somebody who has shown and expressed an empathy towards violence activity to actually being operational or becoming operational. And this was in the air attacks of. of Thankfully, the failed uh, uh, airline uh, hijacking a couple of years ago. What combating violent extremism, or PVE, is meant to do is to actually shift that graph to the left and create resilient communities. What have you guys done? Well, a brief synopsis of CVE is that it's a, failed, it's a failed version of something we had in 2006, and we reviewed it in version 4 and, and decided it doesn't work, but you guys are doing it in the US now. The focus is on violent extremism and not on the ideology. It allows the funding and using of taxpayers' money to organizations that are not outwardly violent but disagree with shared American values such as liberal democratic societies, democracy, women's rights, death to apostates, etc., etc. It builds capacity of non-violent extremists or extremists. It gives credibility to extremists. Senior politicians attend platforms and invite them to government events. That photograph is the American ambassador in the UK inviting British Muslims to an outreach event 
Two thirds of the Muslims that you see in that photograph, the British government classes as extremists, and they will not have anything to do with them. And yet, the Americans, you guys will, not you personally, but the American policy is to reach out and bring them in and work with them. A whole number of reasons for that. One of the things is that they want to use non-violent extremists to de-radicalize violent extremists. This has failed, it's defunct in the UK. And it takes a patronizing view that I find very offensive uh, that the majority of Muslims are in fact um, of the ideology that drives violence and this upsets me and many others and there's a view that if we reach out to them then they'll like us. Uh, let's give them some money. Should taxpayers' money be given to organizations that promote the following views? No Muslims should serve in the US or UK or in nationalist army, especially when they might be fighting other Muslims. Participation in parliament is a sin. Yeah, I'm on the right slide. Living under man-made laws is a sin. You can read the rest. Democracy, doesn't, they don't believe in democracy, freedom of religion. They have a view that the Kuffar in the West have a sinister heritage, of corrupting the image of Islam, etc. And, so, and they show support for scholars that believe homosexuals should be killed. I can prove that US money is going out right now under CVE to organizations that hold these views. Should your money be going to these types of organizations? It's a question. Yeah, I, I guess the answer is no, but, yeah, but that's no. So what hasn't worked? In the UK, we, we believe that, and I'll just fly through, fly through this. I'll give you a, a case that there was a suicide bomber who um, exploded a bomb in Stockholm called Al Abdali. He attended an institution in Luton which was given money in the past by the UK government to de-radicalize violent extremists. You know, they thought these were non-violent guys, best place to actually bring these guys down. They identified this guy, but they weren't able to persuade him that he was wrong. Furthermore, they say that they didn't recognize that this guy could be violent and therefore didn't report him to the police. Why didn't they recognize it? Because he held the same views that they had. How do we know this? On their website, I've downloaded and the Observer newspaper has reported that on their website they had scholars justifying suicide bombing as a legitimate military tactic in the Middle East. These guys have had millions of pounds of British taxpayers' money. They, they on their website, supported attacks on British troops in Iraq and Afghanistan and Iraq. And one of their leading figures, a guy called Ibn Uthameen, believes that attacks on women in Western countries is justified. This is a dangerous notion that Muslims who become Al-Qaeda terrorists can only be wooed back by people who have the same theological views. I'm telling you that the British government, I and many others now, the authorities in Britain, realize that this is not the case and we've changed our, our strategy. Prevent and review, we don't fund non-violent Islamists anymore in Britain, if we know about them. You might ask the question, how does the British government know if somebody is a non-violent Islamist? They call me. They don't call me, they call one of my colleagues. Uh, and then we have to, well, like, whether they are or not. We focus on ideology interventions and individuals now, disrupting all of these key areas. The government no longer engages with organizations that do not espouse shared British values. You guys are going to do that here as well. Preachers who were hitherto not excluded uh, from the UK are now excluded. Dr. Zakenaik, who um, a lot of people in the UK <coughs> You know, watch his TV channel. And, you know, he, he has a number of TV channels in the UK, but he's not allowed in the UK anymore. Neither is Hussein Yee, neither is Bilal Phillips, and a number of others. Funding is cut from organisations who, who are considered to be non violent extremists. No government minister is allowed to or share platforms with non violent extremists. Something that's important, and I talked about this whole debate about Islam, about Islam, good. Extreme right wing organisations who are racist organisations are included in the review. It is a step in the right direction, but there's a lot more to do. Prescri um, um, I will move on to that. Uh, prescription is something that we, we do as well, but it doesn't always work. It needs to be done, but it doesn't actually um, cut out some of the lone wolf uh, terrorism. So what are my recommendations? We need to look, more research needs to be carried, in the, uh, carried out in the US on these key areas. I know what's happening in the UK, I think I know what's happening in the UK, the US, I'm fairly certain, but it's then being able to prove it with evidence, back, uh, with, with data and evidence. Uh, we mustn't isolate individuals from their human needs when we're looking at extremists or people who become radicalised, and 
being able to first dismantle the specific emotional drivers, the worldview, the theological basis of the claims, context in which they live, separate them if necessary from the source of the radicalization, that's what we need to do. But all of this depends upon the specific trajectory as we've defined in some of the pathways um, earlier on. Engagement versus partnership. There is a view with some of my Jewish friends in the, U in the UK, some of my Christian friends in the UK, some of my other friends that, you know what? I've got to talk to people who don't like me. They're the people I need to talk to. And I can tell you that the Islamists don't like me, don't like you, and they'll never like us. So no matter what you do, you will never persuade them to give up their cause. The only thing you will do is, the only thing you can do is to get them to actually denounce the Islamist worldview. All Islamist organizations are anti-Semitic. This won't change. There are plenty of Muslim organizations in New York, in the US, and around the world that are not Islamist and not anti-Semitic. Islamists require political cover, legitimacy, and protection. The first thing Islamists want to do and the first target they have is to build their own capacity, and hence by partnering with them. I was talking to somebody just earlier on today, actually, who said, can you help me talk and engage with, I won't mention the names, uh, of a couple of organizations in New York. Now, I want to know, how can I go and engage with them? They're Muslims, and they won't come and engage with me. I said, don't bother. Because by engaging with them, sorry. I don't know if you're taking comments in the middle or right? I'll, I'll be done. I'll be done. Because I, I just did a quick comment on the slide, yeah, sure. and that was that I completely agree with the slide. And I think, I think that, that this slide is in perfect 180-degree contradistinction to the ethos of the American University. The culture in American universities right now is like that the greatest good is engagement. And there, there's, a, there's an almost, it's almost an idea, there's almost an, an ideology, or a, um, a, a peaceful ideology, an ideology that sees itself as promoting peace, that all engagement is always good in all circumstances. Yeah. I'm sure you're aware of that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I'm just saying, you <laughs> this laid this out so beautifully, but it, it really stands in context. This was the case in the UK as well, but we managed to change some of this. Yeah, a lot more to do there as well. Um, Islamists will claim that they're not anti-Semitic, they'll claim that they're anti-Zionist, and they'll claim that they're anti-Israel. But there was a poll in, by the JPR in 2010, 72% of British Jews self-categorize themselves as Zionist, 80% of British Jews say Israel plays a central or important, uh, but not central role in the, uh, central or important, but not central role in, role in the Jewish identities. 87% of British Jews agree that Jews are responsible for ensuring the survival of Israel, 54% of British Jews who do not self-categorize as Zionists nevertheless agree that Jews are responsible for ensuring the survival of Israel. 78% of British uh, Jews believe in the two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Is it therefore anti-Semitic? Is it therefore, the question, it's a question that I pose then to, to Muslims, if this is the case, is it therefore hurtful to people who are Jews to be anti-Semitic uh, sorry, is it therefore anti-Semitic or hurtful to Jews to be anti-Israel? And it's an interesting question. A lot of work needs to be done on counter-narratives when it comes to anti-Semitism. Uh, we, we can all read this. Uh, we need to look at the, some of the problematic legal stances that are in Muslim-majority countries, look at legislation for political rights for non-Muslims. Egypt right now is great if you're a model Muslim Egyptian male person. If you're a woman, you're non-Muslim, or you're Shia even, or you're somebody who doesn't believe in the Islamist version of Sharia, tough. A little bit more work has to be done in countering some of the uh, some of these um, legislation and political rights, uh, uh, well, countering the political uh, statements and, and the work that's coming out of places like Egypt. Looking at the impending problems of political Islam, we need further cooperation between Muslims and non-Muslims. We need a broad Spectrum. One of the things we did in the UK was we built a broad spectrum, an alliance of people from different political viewpoints, the left, the right, the middle, wherever, and actually need to consider that this is a problem for society as a whole. Come together, build an alliance, and start working together and combating some of these things. Refute some of the underlying assertions and um, tackle the unrepresentative institutions um, and challenging the essential, the essential Islamicity 
of their claims. Finally, learn from the failed PVE, Preventing Violence Extremism Strategy in the UK. Don't give this political legitimacy to non-violence extremism. Don't fund them. They have plenty of money coming in from the Middle East. Engage rather than partner. We have to talk to extremists and Islamists. I believe we have to talk to them. Don't engage with them. Sometimes the conversations have to be debates. Sometimes the conversations have to be discussions. But don't give them money, don't partner with them, don't empower them. Don't help them grow their capacity. It's an organization in the UK uh, who are from a Salafist background. They don't believe in democracy, don't believe in parliament. They believe that women shouldn't go out to work. They believe kill apostates. They believe that all of the things that I talked about, they've had three million dollars of government taxpayers funding. They haven't de-radicalized a single person when I first saw them, they had a congregation of 200. They now have an outreach program. They claim that they can reach 5,000 Muslims. Because $3 million of my money, and other taxpayers' money, was given to them. Finally, there is a focus in the US strategy, and too big a focus on Al-Qaeda. But here's an interesting statistic for you. 60% of the convicted terrorists in the UK have no known connections or links to Al-Qaeda. That's 60%. So why then do we only talk of Al-Qaeda in the Combating Violence Extremism Strategy and the previous Preventing Violence Extremism Strategy as well? And that's me done. So thank you. I hope I didn't uh, go too fast or sort of bombard you with too much information. Uh, you can actually, uh, as I said, there will be a paper in two weeks so you'll be able to read much more into that. Just as, important, just as effectively as men are. The reason why extremists will focus on women a lot more, and this is very, it's their mindset, not mine, is that they see women as being the first university of a child's life, that if they were able to radicalize a woman, uh, she is then going to go on to get married and have kids, and she will then radicalize her children, and they will go on and become an exponential growth in radicalization. I don't necessarily ascribe to their worldview on, on how they treat women, but that is something that has not been happening, this reason has been happening for a while. <coughs> Yet at the same time, they will actually give them a lot less rights <coughs> than somebody who is not radicalized will have. But the problem with women, British Muslim women, and maybe in the US as well, is that the Muslim women will suffer from, just, just like a lot of women will suffer from gender, prejudices. Muslim women will then will suffer from the same prejudice, but they'll be told that that grievance is not because they're women, but because they're Muslim. And that is a much easier way of building on a grievance. Another way is, uh, one of the guys that I do radicalize and actually helped to set up Century Women, he was a senior member of his Hizmetahri in the UK. Uh, he was on the National Executive Committee. I don't know if you guys have heard of a guy called Majid Iqbal. That's uh, Majid Noir, sorry. Um, you may have heard of it. Uh, he's the, he, he radicalized Majid Nawaz and then de radicalized him as well. <laughs> and got him out of his Bataria. And he's one of my colleagues. He tells this story where he was sitting on a train when he was in his Bataria. And he saw a woman who was, had a child with her. 
and she was reading a newspaper, and on the newspaper there was a headline story of um, somebody who'd been a sexual predator, paedophile. This must be important. Yeah. So he created a perceived potential problem and recruiting her by saying this is a potential problem, creating this lens by which to view this worldview that I talked about, and eventually ended up recruiting her to his pizzeria. He left his pizzeria, she's still there. And she's got children uh, who are probably nine or ten or more now, and they're members of his pizzeria as well, and then the indoctrination and grow. So, yes, women are being recognized. Uh, we have done some work in uh, the UK and trying to map out to what extent, uh, but I'm not happy with the conclusions uh, and the methodology, which is what we have published in. Well, let me, I think there's another question. Another? Hi. Okay. Do you have time? Yeah. Um, well, last question. You mentioned um, work being done by the NYPD in hmm. New York City, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate a little on that and also your thoughts on the balance, I think would be the word, between um, New York City police officers monitoring mosques or Muslim communities in the metropolitan area, infringing on someone's rights to gather versus mon the, nece the necessity of monitoring communities. Interesting question. It's about balancing the necessity of evil, I guess. I mean, it's, it's how far do you go yeah. in encroaching on somebody's human rights? Uh, it's a question that, well, first of all, there's been some good work and strategic work, and, and there is a report. I don't know if you've seen a copy of it. Um, I think Harry's got, uh, was it Harry or one of you yeah, guys mentioned it happened. earlier on? If you can maybe disseminate that, that'd be great. Um, and they've looked at where they, they've observed radicalization is taking place and what the trajectory has been, and it's been a bit linear, um, from my view. But I believe that when the report was commissioned, that was the real. That was what was happening on the ground. I think things have moved on. And I think things have changed now. Uh, and I think it's a dynamic um, um, battle struggle, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I think now that if I was having a chat with them and we were sort of uh, uh, talk, we were to talk about things, we find that some yes, their basic premises are correct, but some of the the, uh, the realities on the ground have maybe changed and moved on. The interesting question you've raised about monitoring. It's important to monitor. If, I'll give you an example. When I, when I, 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 flew, I flew in yesterday, and I flew in from Manchester to Shannon, thank you William, and then from <laughs> Shannon to New York. When I got off at Shannon, which is Nyland, I had to get out, clear immigration, uh, customs, and then get back on again, and I had to do a pre-customs and pre-immigration check. Uh, uh, with the US Immigration Service that was sitting there. I went along, took my fingerprints, and they took an iris scan and everything, and they interviewed me for one hour. I was the only person that was interviewed. But then again, I was the only person that was brown. Okay. One hour it took. They asked me all sorts of questions, asked me all this thing, and in the end, I ended up giving them a lecture on all these limits, etc. And then in the end, I just thought, just Google me. You'll see that the bad guys hate me, and the good guys like me, essentially. Or you would consider to be good guys. Yeah. And eventually they let me in. And my first thought as I was walking through um, um, was, oh, that was inconvenient. But then I had a thought. If I was getting on that plane with my wife and my children, as bad as this may sound, and this is me, somebody who's brown, somebody who's Muslim, a practicing Muslim, If there was somebody else that looked like me, I would want to make sure that that person was checked out thoroughly. It's a reality of life. If my wife and children were going on, on that plane, as long as it's done in an ethical manner, as long as it's done in a manner that does not infringe human rights, and this is the debate. That's a much more, it's a much wider debate than should it be done or shouldn't it be done, and how should it be done. As long as it's done, the parameters and the criteria. Unfortunately, it's a reality of some of the world that we live in. Now, what's even better, and what we've done in some parts of the UK, 
is to find moderates in the Muslim community and actually help them understand that, you know what, you're the victims of extremism, first victims, which they are. You believe in human rights, you believe in all the good things, the wider sense of community. You know, we have a concept in, in Arabic called maslaha, which is for the wider benefits of the community, be it Muslim, non-Muslim, or whatever. How can we work together? That's even better. So co-opting and working with moderate and inverted commas, mainstream Muslim organizations that aren't Islamists, that are not extremists, is a much better way. And I'll tell you what, once you get these people on your side, the police may not have to do as much monitoring as they maybe have had to do in recent times. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.